What if I told you that even though the 14 and the 16 inch MacBook Pros can be specced out with the same chip, there's an actual difference in how they manage sustained performance. Ever since I published my first video about these two laptops, I've been getting the same questions over and over again. Should I get the 14 or the 16? Is the 16 inch too big? Are they worth the money? What's the right combination of specs? And all of those are really good questions. There was one unexpected result when I tested performance. I have the base models of both right now and I also have fully specced out versions on the way, so you'll see some comparisons very soon. When I first saw these two and I was trying to choose which one I wanted, I thought 14 inch all the way. I mean, the 16 inch, it's a monster, it's, it's just too much. When I want a laptop, I want something that's more portable and I just wasn't sure that I would wanna carry this big and heavy laptop with me. But being the good little tech person that I am, I wanted to be able to provide you with some more insight and I decided to take a look at both. So from a design standpoint, they are virtually identical. Obviously the 16 inch is bigger and it's actually slightly thicker, but if I showed them to you without context, you wouldn't be able to tell which is which. Both have a much more boxy design than the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro. Both are heavier and you're definitely gonna notice that if you're upgrading. So the 14 inch weighs 3.5 pounds or 1.6 kilograms. Then the 16 inch is 4.7 pounds or 2.1 kilograms. So they pretty much make the three pound M1 MacBook Pro feel like a MacBook Air. But the point of these laptops isn't to prioritize convenience. It's to pack as much power and efficiency as possible into a laptop. And to that end, I would say Apple crushed it. Look, one of the things that absolutely drove me crazy about the 13 inch MacBook Pro were the ports. Having a Pro device with only two Thunderbolt 3 ports and a headphone jack just wasn't good enough in my opinion, especially when you had to use one of them to charge the laptop. Well, all of that is the thing of the past now. Both of these models have three Thunderbolt 4 ports, two on the left, one on the right, and each one of them has a maximum transfer speed of 40 gigabits per second. On top of getting an extra port, we can now charge these laptops and connect accessories from both sides, which is something that I wasn't able to do with the 13 inch MacBook Pro. On the right side, we're also getting an SD card slot, which a ton of creators are gonna like, and there's an HDMI port that you could use to easily connect to a monitor, projector, or a TV. The port is HDMI 2.0 and not 2.1, but for how I use it, I still haven't thought of any way where that would be a practical limitation. And speaking of external displays, if you get either of these with an M1 Pro chip, you can connect up to two 60 Hertz 6K displays. And if you get them with an M1 Max chip, then you can connect up to three 60 Hertz 6K displays and then a fourth 60 Hertz 4K display. Now, I was super happy about this upgrade because I can see a lot of users taking advantage of a dual or a triple display setup. We're not quite getting as crazy as my seven monitor main workstation, but for a laptop, considering that you can still use the built-in display, you can get up to five displays total right out of the box, which is awesome. Or you can close it up, use it in clamshell mode, and then virtually repurpose all this processing power with a dedicated desktop setup. Now, besides the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack that we're still getting on the left-hand side, there's one other port that I haven't mentioned, MagSafe. Look, to me, again, this is a sign of a pro device because it means that we have options. If you have a charger with you, you have access to super fast MagSafe charging. You have protection against a sudden pull on the cable because the MagSafe will disconnect and you're not having to use one of the ports for charging. If you're in a bind and you don't have the power adapter with you, then you can still use any of the three Thunderbolt ports to charge. Now, speaking of power adapters, here we actually see a hardware difference between the two. So starting with the 16 inch, you're getting a 140 watt USB-C power adapter, which is an absolute monster. With the 14 inch, if you get the eight core CPU base model, the one that I have, then it comes with a 67 watt power adapter. And if you go with a 10 core CPU model, then you get a 96 watt adapter. And for some reason, if you still want the larger adapter with the base model, you can upgrade for 20 bucks. Now I'll come back to battery life in a minute, but let's talk about these displays. So clearly one of the main reasons to get the 16 inch model is the display. It's not the only advantage, but it's a big one. I do my best to read all of your comments and I got a lot of questions about whether the 16 feels that much bigger than the 14. And the answer is absolutely. The moment you sit in front of it, it's so close to you and it's such a beautiful display that you just can't help but smile. Now, when we look at the numbers, we're getting a 16.2 inch display versus a 14.2 inch display, a resolution of 3456 by 2234, 
versus 3024 by 1964. So again, it's a meaningful difference. Like if you're watching content, of course, everything is bigger, but to me, that's just a bonus. So when I'm multitasking and I have two apps open at the same time, there's a lot more room for each app. If I'm on the web, I don't have to scroll as much. When I'm editing videos, the timeline is a lot wider and I can see more of the content in each bin. And if I'm editing photos, I always love having as much screen real estate as possible. Now, to be completely fair, coming from the 13 inch MacBook Pro, even the 14 inch feels bigger, but the 16 inch just takes things to a whole new level. And I honestly didn't think that I would like it because even seeing it at the store, I remember chuckling at the size, but after using this display, I miss it when I go back to the smaller devices. Now, as far as the types of screens, both are liquid retina XDR displays. So it's the same mini LED technology that we saw on the 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro. Both have a maximum sustained brightness of 1000 nits and a peak brightness of 1600 for HDR content, which looks absolutely spectacular. Both are also ProMotion displays, which is Apple's adaptive refresh rate of up to 120 hertz. So depending on what you're doing, the display can go from 24 hertz all the way up to 120 hertz in order to optimize the user experience and maximize battery life. And since we're talking about the battery, the 14 inch has a 70 watt hour battery, which is rated for 17 hours of video playback. Now the 16 inch model comes with a 100 watt hour battery. It's rated for 21 hours, which makes it the highest rated MacBook. Now this title used to belong to the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro with 20 hours, but with a much larger battery, the 16 inch is now king. What's great there is that with the 13 inch, I already felt like I never had to charge it. So I'm super excited to see how both of these perform. And I'll definitely include more information in my long-term reviews. Now, I had certain expectations of the keyboard and trackpad, but there was something there that surprised me. Now, both keyboards are the same size and they have a black anodized aluminum well, which I really like because it visually separates the keyboard from the rest of the frame. We also now have a full row of function keys at the top rather than the touch bar on the previous version. And I know that a lot of users are extremely happy about that. Now the keys themselves feel exactly the same. And this is one of my favorite keyboards on any laptop but I actually prefer typing on the 16 inch because the entire palm rest assembly is so big that I feel much more supported. Now, I was not expecting this. I thought that the 16 inch might feel a little bit awkward because of the size, but for me, it's actually better. Now, the trackpad is also bigger on the 16 inch. It's kind of crazy. It's like the size of my entire hand. And I think Apple makes my favorite trackpads. You can click anywhere on them. They have pressure sensing capabilities and these have been super responsive and accurate for me. Now on the top right of both keyboards, we see the new implementation of Touch ID with a larger key. There's also a divot in the center of the key, which guides your finger to the right spot. Now, I really wish that we could get Face ID just for unlocking, but it looks like we're gonna need to keep waiting because the necessary components aren't included. I'm still curious about the width of this notch. Other than the camera and the True Tone sensor, I wonder what else is back there to make the notch this wide. Very quickly, speaking of the camera system, I'm finally happy with the MacBook Pro camera. The one on the M1 MacBooks was fine and with the image signal processor on the M1 chip, it helped, but it was still 720p and with so many people having to do video calls, it was time for an upgrade. Now, both of these have the same new 1080p camera and with the new ISP, it's supposed to deliver even better low light performance. And if you wanna see a comparison of the current and previous cameras, check out my comparison of the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro and the 14 inch MacBook Pro. The speakers were also upgraded. And even though they both have the same high fidelity six speaker system, when you look at the specs, they don't sound the same. So the 14 inch sounds very good, like even better than the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro, which was already the best sounding laptop that I owned. Having said that, the 16 inch is even better than that. So the sound is warmer, it's fuller, and this is now the best sounding laptop that I've tested. Before we talk about processing power and the differences between the two, I want to talk about the notch because it's been the focus of so many people. So let me start off by saying that the notch is clearly there and you can clearly see it unless you have a dark menu bar or a dark wallpaper. So if you think it looks ugly and that that's somehow going to ruin the user experience for you, don't buy one of these. 
On the other hand, for how I use these laptops, it's always over the menu bar or a black background if I'm watching content, so it simply hasn't been a real life issue for me. So would I rather have it not be there? Sure, if I didn't have to give up anything, just like with my iPhone, but does it actually matter for how I use these? No. Now the one potential issue I noticed is that if you have enough menu items to reach the notch, then the notch would actually hide active menu items. The closest that I got was with Premiere Pro, so it hasn't actually been an issue and I'm curious to see how Apple handles this moving forward. Now let's get to processing power and the differences I noticed in how these two models handle the heat buildup. Now because I have the base models of the 14 and the 16, they both come with the M1 Pro and 16 gigabytes of unified memory. The 14 inch comes with an eight core CPU and a 14 core GPU, and the 16 inch comes with a 10 core CPU and a 16 core GPU. So I expected the 16 to outperform the 14 head on, and it does. A Geekbench scores for both were just what I expected. Very similar for single core performance and then the 16 inch coming out ahead for multi-core performance because of the additional CPU cores. For GPU performance and Geekbench, again, the 16 inch comes out ahead because of the two additional GPU cores. What I wanted to know was how well these two can handle an even more demanding task. So I used Cinebench R23 and I first got these baseline scores. What's absolutely crazy is that I then ran a 30 minute test. So that's running at 100% CPU capacity for 30 minutes straight and the results were very interesting. So on the 14 inch, the fans turned on after one minute and 40 seconds of running at 100% and then they ramped up to about 3300 RPM. On the 16 inch, even with the two additional CPU cores, the fans only turned on after two minutes and 40 seconds of running at 100%, and then they never went up above about 1700 RPM. So with the extra heat that's generated by the two additional high performance cores, the 16 inch still remained cooler. What's super impressive is that both were able to sustain the same level of performance even after 30 minutes of running at 100% on battery power. All right, so now let's pick the right model based on what you're looking to do. And remember that I have links in the description which a lot of times have lower prices than the Apple Store. If you're still thinking of getting the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro, I would highly recommend that you watch my 14 inch versus 13 inch comparison before you make that purchase. If you've already decided that you need more performance or one of the other reasons that I mentioned to go with the 14, here's what I would do. The 16 inch M1 Pro model already comes with a 10 core CPU and a 16 core GPU. And that will be an absolute monster for the vast majority of users. If for your very specific workflow, you're going to gain some performance from the additional GPU cores, then I think the additional 400 bucks to double them from 16 to 32 with the M1 Max is worth it. Now this is going to be in very rare cases and those users should already know that they need it. Basically, if you're not sure whether or not you need the M1 Max, you don't need it. Where you may wanna put your money is into additional unified memory and then upgrade to 32 gigs. This chip is so powerful that this laptop should last you for a very long time and you'll never regret having more unified memory. With the 14 inch, you have more options. So if the M1 on the 13 inch is powerful enough for you, but you're getting the 14 inch because of the larger display or the additional ports or the better camera or the external display support, then the base model is just fine. And again, I would consider adding unified memory only because I can't imagine you needing to upgrade this laptop for so many years. If you have the 200 bucks and you want the additional performance, upgrade to the 10 core CPU, which as we saw, improves the performance by about 33% since you're going from six high performance cores to eight. Now that you watch this comparison, you should watch this video right here. Click on my face to subscribe. Hopefully this video was helpful. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.